السلام عليكم ورحمة الله دكتور خليل السالم معاكم uh, Today I'll be going to discuss retinoblastoma just basic sciences for the medical student My name is Khalil Salem. I'm an associate professor at Mu'ta University uh, I am an ocular plastic surgeon at the Department of uh, Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences So why to study about retinoblastoma? Retinoblastoma is the most common intraocular cancer in children. This is the eighth most common pediatric cancer uh, overall, especially uh, in the first year. Around 11% of children with cancer are diagnosed uh, in the first year of life. And, and uh, the ratio is around one in 15,000 to one in 18,000 living births. So the mortality rate uh, is different in different countries. So in poor countries, usually the mortality rate can reach up to 40%, while uh, in developed countries, mortality can reach uh, to a minimum of 3%. So uh, this is an autosomal dominant disease. It is caused by a mutation in the RB gene 1. So if the cell has the RB gene, uh, the mutated RB gene expression is always there. So pe the penetrance of uh, the disease is 100%. If you have the gene, then the cell is mutated. This is a cancerous cell and uh, it will form retinoblastoma. There are two important types of this mutation. So we have hereditary retinoblastoma, which is uh, which accounts for 40% of cases, and we have the non-hereditary type or the sporadic type, which is seen in 60%. So the hereditary type, uh, usually the germline, the RB gene is found in all cells, all cells of the body. The uh, uh, person is more liable for secondary cancer and tumor. And family history is present in 10%. 90% of cases are bilateral or trilateral. And most of them, they have multifocal disease. So non-hereditary retinoblastoma or the sporadic type. The RB gene usually affects retinal cells only. It's unifocal, unilateral usually, and there is no family history. The clinical presentation of retinoblastoma in the hereditary type usually present in the first year of life, before 12 months. It's a bilateral disease, multifocal, or a trilateral, especially if the pineal gland is affected. Yani there is a brain tumor as well. 10% have lifelong risk. 10% uh, uh, of patients have other cancers, such as osteosarcomas, Ewing sarcoma, and other uh, tumors in the body. Non-hereditary retinoblastoma is usually unifocal, unilateral, and there is no lifelong risk of secondary cancers other than uh, when, uh, if you are using, for example, chemo or radiotherapy, it can carry some slight risk of secondary cancer afterwards, but it's not related to the disease in this case. The importance to ask about family history. So this is an autosomal dominant disease. Okay. So if you have a positive family history with multifocal disease or unifocal disease or a bilateral or a trilateral disease, the uh, penetrance, uh -huh, the uh, ability of that person to transmit the disease to the offsprings is 100%. However, this declines a lot if we have a negative family history mm -hmm, with uh, unifocality. So the ability to transmit the disease is only 5 to 15%. Okay. So, um, so the most common presentation uh, in children is the uh, presence of leukocoria or a white pupil. However, it's not 
uh, always leukocoria. Sometimes the pupil can be grayish. Sometimes the eye can be ophthalmic due to an increase in the intraocular pressure, like this patient here. Uh, they can present with a squint. Sometimes they can present with thysis bulby if they are lucky enough. Uh, so this is a very unfortunate uh, child because he didn't have early treatment. However, he's lucky because the tumor has regressed and uh, and the uh, the eye is some sort somewhat blind. Um, if we can look at this picture here, you can see various uh, pupils with various colors. So we have the yellow. We have the white, we have the red, and the grayish one. This is another picture showing also the presence of a grayish uh, color, white leukocoria, red uh, reflex. Um, this is somewhat yellowish because of the uh, hyphema that they might develop. This is a leukoma. So we have multiple presentations. So don't think that it's just a white or a yellow pupil. Here you can see a change in the iris color along with the presence of strabismus. Sometimes uh, things can come to you to the, uh, to the clinic with uh, in, in a very bad condition. For example, this child here has total hyphema. Okay. This child has um, a, um, a red conjunctiva, a very large eye, a glaucoma. Uh, this patient has, these patients have pseudocellulitis, which means that the, the tumor is really growing rapidly, that it can represent uh, cellulitis, the eye is closed. You start giving the patient antibiotics, you think it's cellulitis. But what really can discriminate whether the patient has uh, pseudocellulitis or uh, let's say pseudocellulitis from true cellulitis is the CT scan. So intraocular calcification, if seen on CT scan, this can help us a lot in differentiating that this patient has retinoblastoma rather than having orbital cellulitis. So why does calcification happen in retinoblastoma? This is secondary to a rapid increase in the size of the tumor with that doesn't match the blood supply of the tumor. So this will cause necrosis of the cell, spillage of the uh, DNA, which is negatively charged because of the phosphorus compound, and then you have the calcium, which will attract, which, which will be attracted to the negatively charged DNA, and it will club there to form the calcification. So that's why uh, calcification happens in patients with retinoblastoma. And the calcification means that this is a highly, uh, this is a, a, a rapidly growing tumor and uh, the growth uh, will, might end up with spontaneous regression or, let's say, partial death of the tumor. <clears throat> Pseudohypopian also can happen. This is a, uh, these are multiple pictures. If you can see here, uh, the, there's a, a fluid level. You think that this is hypopian or uh, you might uh, mistaken it for endogenous uh, endophthalmitis. Uh, however, uh, those children all were proven to have retinoblastoma. Now, thysis bulby also can happen, and we talked about that several times uh, because you know the 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 tumor has regressed, and with it the whole eye also. These this is a patient with bilateral thysis bulby. You can see the intraocular calcification on CT scan, and this is a ophthalmic eye. Sometimes the tumor might overgrow might overgrow and it might extend out of the orbit. As you can see, the, the eye has uh, opened. This is actually the cornea. The eye has opened and this is actually the tumor and it's going actually back and extending to the brain. This is another tumor where it has extended to the outer surface. 
As for the uh, classification of uh, the disease, the most important one is the international classification of retinoblastoma, uh, and it depends on the size, the site of the tumor, presence of vitreal seeds, or uh, let's say extension of the tumor outside the eye. So group A, these are tumor size less than three millimeter, and uh, they are away from the macula, away from the optic nerve, and there is no subretinal uh, fluid nor seeds. Group B, tumor size is more than three millimeter, uh, might involve the macula or there is subretinal seeding. Uh, it, the, uh, it's more or less proximal to the nerve, uh, but uh, there is no seeding of the vitreous. Okay, it's only uh, uh, subretinal fluid might be present only. Now, group C, this is a larger tumor, presence of subretinal fluid, macula might be involved, the optic nerve might be involved, and uh, the there is a uh, subretinal C, submacular seeding. These are small amount of seeds, as you can see here, that are in, in close proximity to the tumor, but it is not involving uh, the vitreous, as we will see in group D. Here in group D, you can see that the whole vitreous is, uh, has uh, seeds of retinoblastoma. And in advanced tumors, uh, this is actually group E rather than group B. So this is group E. This is a tumor, very large tumor with diffuse vitreal seeds. And it's, 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 and the tumor is really extensive. It's really huge. And uh, uh, it requires inoculation uh, in order to treat the patient. Now we come to the treatment. So we have two types of, let's say, three uh, modalities of treatment. We have the focal therapy. Okay, and we have the systemic therapy. So the focal therapy, we have the cryotherapy, we have the uh, laser therapy, either transpupillary thermotherapy, or uh, we have uh, inoculation. Also, it's a form of focal therapy as regarded by some. Uh, systemic, uh, I, it's either in the uh, form of chemotherapy. So we give intravitreal chemotherapy, intravit intravenous, uh, or, uh, uh, sorry, intra uh, intra-arterial chemotherapy, intravitreal or intravenous chemotherapy, uh, as well as subtenin chemotherapy can be also uh, given in focal tumors. Um, also, we have radiotherapy, such as uh, plaque therapy and external beam therapy. So let's go back and talk a little bit about cryotherapy. The idea of cryotherapy is to destroy parts of the cell of the tumor, which will cause a thrombosis of the uh, arterial and venous uh, parts of the tumor. This will jeopardize further the sub blood supply to the tumor, and it will cause the tumor to go into necrosis. Now, cryotherapy is effective for small lesions, which means uh, it's, it's around the three millimeter and it has to be in the equator, okay, away from the macula, away from the optic nerve. So in this case, we can use cryotherapy effectively. And usually we do between two and three sessions of cryotherapy, uh, which are uh, very effective in this case. Transpupillary thermotherapy is also effective uh, and it can be used alone or in conjunction with chemotherapy. Uh, what we use is something called TTT, trans, uh, uh, transpupillary thermotherapy, or uh, what we do is we, uh, we cook the tumor uh, with very big spots of laser and uh, usually uh, it's done between uh, four and five sessions along with the uh, chemotherapy if needed. Inoculation is usually uh, done for uh, solitary uh, tumors, those with the sporadic cases, and it's a very large tumor that require uh, the eye to be taken out 
we, uh, where uh, intravenous chemotherapy or let's say chemotherapy or cryo or transpiratory therapy are not applicable. Uh, the most important complication of transpapillary thermotherapy is the um, subsequent uh, formation of cataract. And this actually happens if we are doing the laser more than seven minutes. Um, now, regarding systemic therapy, uh, we use vincristine and carboplatin for intravenous or intra-arterial chemotherapy. Now we mean by intra-arterial is that we catheterize the femoral artery and then uh, the, uh, the catheter goes up to the common carotid, the internal carotid, the first branch of the internal carotid is the ophthalmic artery and this is where intra-arterial melphalan or vincristine and sometimes carboplatin can be injected deliberately into the uh, artery in order to deliver the uh, chemotherapy uh, to the tumor. Intravena intravitreal chemotherapy using melphalan also is a very common practice along with subtenin and melphalan. Um, generally we use between five to seven cycles of uh, uh, intravitreal chemotherapy and a combination of chemotherapy and uh, a transpapillary thermotherapy can be used in order to uh, treat some tumors. As you can see here, this is a tumor that has regressed using chemotherapy. Look at the size of the tumor, how after chemotherapy it just goes into necrosis and calcification. Now, finally, plaque therapy. Now, plaque therapy, this is a radioactive material that is uh, put uh, locally af uh, after disinserting the muscle, and you put the, uh, the plaque along with the platinum shield uh, on the uh, patient's eye for around five days. You just keep them in hospital, and after that, you... Uh, take out the radioactive material with the uh, shield again. Uh, external beam radiotherapy is not used anymore uh, or, uh, except for some rare cases where you have a really huge extension of the tumor. And I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.